In your headlines tonight, further assurance. Minister of Local Government and Provincial Councils Faiza Mustafa says no more barriers to hold many polls. Disagreeing with his own, Minister Sagala Ratnayaka says he does not agree with the statement made by the Inspector General of Police over the Kintora incident. Unexpected end of an alliance, UPFA decide on the future course of their part in elections. Providing basic facilities, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe insists the government is fully committed to make healthcare, education and housing accessible to all. On the global arena, no more meddling. Australia cracks down on foreign interferences in domestic politics. While in the United States, Donald Trump's immigration policy gets the Supreme Court nod. Good evening, bringing you news and developments from across Sri Lanka and around the world. On Other Than a 24 7, first at 9, I'm Indivari Amwath. We begin with tonight's top local stories. The Local Government Elections Act will be resubmitted to Parliament tomorrow in order for several printing mistakes to be rectified in its singular version. The matter was revealed by the Secretary to the Ministry of Local Government and Provincial Councils, Kamal Padmasiri, along with the Subject Minister, Faiza Mustafa, at a media briefing on development projects undertaken by the Ministry over the last three years. Minister Mustafa, meanwhile, went on to say that he himself, along with his ministerial secretary, have finalised everything necessary for the upcoming local government polls. All accusations levelled against me are now over. The Gazette notification was issued. Gazette by the President was also published. Our ministry has arranged everything necessary for the elections. Don't point your finger at us. Our ministry has arranged everything required to have an election. <laughs> The election will not be postponed. Any citizen has a right to file a case. We have not made any changes during the demarcation of the Adams Peak. We will produce necessary information before court and prove our accuracy. Both myself and my secretary know that Sri Padi is sacred grounds. Furthermore, Minister Champika Ranavaka has announced that Sri Padi area as a holy site. Some claim that the Sri Padi area has been marked under Nuerelia, taking it out from the Ratnapura district. Nothing of the sort is done. I do not perform the duty of the Election Commission. The head of the Election Commission has made a statement announcing that the election will be held on or before the 17th of February. As a citizen of this country and as a minister of this government, I accept it. Otherwise, we should go before courts. And the Central Working Committee of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and the Executive Committee of the United People's Freedom Alliance convened today under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena. Speaking to other Derana, parliamentarian Dinesh Gunawardana stated that the approval was given for parties of the UPFA to contest the election separately. Meanwhile, at a media briefing of the SLFP, Minister of Ports and Shipping, Mahinda Samrasinghe made evident that empowering other parties is a punishable action in accordance with the party constitution. He made this comment at a media briefing held at the SLFP headquarters today. The Central Working Committee of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party convened today at the Presidential Secretariat under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena. Later, the Executive Committee of the United People's Freedom Alliance also convened under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena with parliamentarians including Dinesh Gunavardhana, Arumugam Thundaman and many other joining the discussions. Following the discussion, which went on for about two and a half hours, ministers and parliamentarians expressed their views regarding the discussion. All members of our party unanimously decided to contest from the UPFA. We decided to contest from a broad alliance and to unite in order to win the election. 
He made a request at the alliance meeting to allow them to contest separately on electorate basis. We tried to contest together, but we did not receive a positive response from their side. We will contest the election and we have good candidates. We have no conflict since they have their rights. The group representing Thondaman and Ataullah said that they will contest together with the SLFP. Uh, Speaking to other Dirana, MP Dinesh Gunavardhana stated that approval was given for parties of the UPFA to contest the election separately. Under the constitution of the SLFP, empowering another party is illegal. That itself is enough for a court order to remove them from their parliamentary posts and chase them away from the party. <laughs> We convene for media briefings at the party headquarters while they do so at a temple. We shouldn't go to the temple, they should come to the party headquarters and they should discuss with us and should work to strengthen the party. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksha should join hands with the SLFP. He should be here and not with the GL Pires. Hmm. We took a decision through the Central Working Committee to be with the government and we have signed an agreement. We have to renew the agreement by the end of December. The Central Working Committee will take the necessary decisions. We'll bring you more on that. Minister of Law and Order Sagala Ratnayaka says he does not agree with the statement made by Inspector General of Police over the Ginthota incident where he said the police failed to fulfil their responsibility. Minister Sagala Ratnayaka made the statement in Parliament today responding to a question by leader of the JVP, Anrakumara Desanayaka. Statements by 134 individuals have been taken with regard to the Ginthot incident. All physical as well as property damages are recorded too. The police, SDF, Navy and Army officers are still deployed in the area. It was wrong to ease security in the area when there was a possibility of the particular situation to aggravate once more. And then the IGP said at a meeting in Gaul that the police failed with regards to this situation. Who is he passing the responsibility over to? Either he himself has to accept responsibility or take action against those who are responsible after conducting an investigation. Well, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe insists the government is committed to matching the country's public services with the large-scale development they envisage while making healthcare, education and housing more accessible to all. Addressing an event held in Colombo yesterday, the Premier also touched on what's needed to be done to improve the standards of living in the country. The National Health Research Symposium 2017 was held under the patronage of Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe yesterday. Organised by the Minister of Health, the event was held under the theme of promoting research culture by sharing evidence-based research, best practices and innovation. Developing our own research capabilities is the next step to bolstering our understanding of serious health issues facing Sri Lankan public. As our economy grows, I want to ensure that we are investing into these services so that they are available to everyone, including those in our rural areas. Since we came to government, public spending on health care is up as much as by 55%. 2018 budget, we have allocated over 200 billion rupees for health sector. We scope to increase this. A strong economy and good infrastructure will bring foreign investment. This government is trusted by the international community to deliver a fair and just economy where foreign companies and local companies both will invest. We are seeking economic development on a scale never seen before in Sri Lanka. And we are committed to ensuring that our basic public services matches this development and health, education and housing is available to everyone at affordable prices. Deputy Leader of the Jathika Nidahas Peramuna, Veera Kumara Disanayaka, emphasizes that both President Maitripala Sirisena and former President Mahinda Rajapaksa should come together on a political platform for the country's progress. He made the remark at a media briefing in Anuradhapura today. Some forces which worked hard to defeat former President Mahinda Rajapaksha are now attempting to tarnish his good name. Though he was defeated, they failed to destroy him. Now they're trying to keep him in a corner. 
Some are advising him not to join and not to unite. Unless these two unite for the 2020 presidential election, the whole country would be defeated. Are we here to bring Mr. Vikramasinghe into power? The MPs of the joint opposition should answer. How can we win? There are three candidates for the 2020 election. SLFP votes are divided into two. Leftist parties are divided into two. Then Mr. Vikramasinghe wins. In 2005, Mr. Rajapaksha won the election with a small margin of 150,000 votes. Meanwhile, journalist questioned Veeru Kumar Disanayak as to what his current stance is. My party isn't important. What is important is a party's vision and its journey. I was in the JVP and left. Later joined the Jati Gini the If my mission is over, then that is it. No, I have not made a decision yet. It will be decided later. Minister of Finance and Mass Media Mangala Samarabira says the new laws and regulations are required to tackle issues in modern day censorship. The minister made the statement delivering a lecture titled Politics and Media at a function organized by the Sri Lanka Working Journalists Association this evening. <laughs> I believe the conflict between media and politics is an important element in a democracy. You can see that the power battle between the two changes from one era to another. During the period between 2005 and 2015, you can see how powerful the government and its politicians were. As a government, we managed to balance this situation out during the past two and a half years. We still see flaws. However, we managed to pass the Right to Information Act in Parliament. Some ask, to fix the ways of state media before pointing fingers at private media institutions. I believe that state media does a much better job in providing accurate and unbiased information. After I came into this position, I have given the freedom to criticize if they must because they too have a right to say what they need to say. On the other hand, we have social media. We're not allowed to ban a website just because there are things that need to be censored. For that, we need laws that are compatible with today's day and age. The weather has been the topic of much discussion and concern recently with adverse weather bringing deaths and property destruction across the country. According to the latest data, the low pressure zone that is passing over the Bay of Bengal is currently moving at 950 kilometers away from southeast part of the country. However, the Department of Meteorology says that this is likely to develop into a depression within the next 24 hours. The Med Department as well as the Disaster Management Centre warns fishermen not to venture into sea until Friday. The Department of Meteorology informs that as a result of the low pressure zone in the Bay of Bengal, wind speed in the northeast, eastern and southeast coastal areas of the country could reach up to 90 to 100 km per hour. The low pressure area which was in the southeast Bay of Bengal, now it lies 950 km away from Sri Lanka. It is likely to be developed into a depression uh, within the next 24 hours. However, we can expect strong winds, about 90 to 100 uh, km per hour in the central Bay of Bengal. Bengal from uh, east coast and beyond so we can expect some uh, 60 to 70 km per hour winds in addition we can expect a uh, strong winds over north north central and eastern province of Sri Lanka and western Sabargamua Ampara and Batikro district Meanwhile, Deputy Director of the Disaster Management Center Pradeep Kodipili advised the public not to panic following false tsunami warnings there is no interest for those uh, the tsunami or whatever no need to panic uh, when the public will be uh, thoroughly advised not to panic uh, because they have a 117 call center number and a 267002 number so they can access via those two numbers and this, they can confirm all the situations in the country. So depression is moving towards to India. So since uh, yesterday we are continuously monitoring the situations and alerting all the uh, tri-forces, military and all other uh, government officials and district level officials and uh, vulnerable communities. So with that, uh, we have standby all the responsible emergency agencies uh, to face for this uh, disaster condition. Still, uh, fishermen will be advised not to go to the sea and uh, so people need to be uh, away from the beaches. Even the fishermen will be advised from the western area not to go to the eastern sea and the northern sea. With strong wind adversaries by the meteorology department during the past few days, fishermen in several coastal areas refrained from venturing into sea. 
Meanwhile, one fisherman lost his life in the sea when lightning struck the boat. The deceased had ventured to sea with another from Old Port in Devinuara. Meanwhile, First at Nine inquired about the much-discussed sea creatures which crawled ashore along the coastal of Naval ADI in Batticalo. We received the sample today. We examined the fins and uh, other external organs. Uh, we concluded it has uh, a snake kill. It is uh, very difficult to say that this is uh, due to a tsunami. Uh, we don't have any evidence to say like that. These species might have migrated for spawning. Uh, during that time, they have been caught to the fishing net. Because the weather has changed, the change in weather is favorable for the spawning. Because the surface temperature there might be sudden changes that might be the possible reason for the spawning a march was organized today in protest of the recent poaching of gargamo tasca also known as the dalaput tua the protest march circled the vihara mahadevi park in colombo while the public library and the nelum pokuna theater the protest march was worked off with the participation of intellectuals, members of the Mahasangha and other religious clergy, as well as members of environmental organizations. They stressed that the public should be vigilant and stand up to such crimes. The protesters also urged that the culprits in the Tusker's death should not be let off under the influence of the mighty. Meanwhile, an advocacy program of the conservation project on dugons and seagrass was held today. Dugons or sea cows as they are better known are animals which habit the seas of Sri Lanka with most people knowing very little of the slow moving creatures. Addressing the gathering at the event, Sri Lankan wildlife researcher Ranil Nanaikara said that measures should be taken to protect the dugons population in Sri Lanka as it leads to the conservation of many endangered species in the ecosystem. Uh, studies done show that dugons travel for over 1000 kilometers when foraging for food. Interestingly, uh, excavations carried out in Jetavanarame, they discovered several artifacts and one was actually uh, this particular artifact uh, which was carved out of dugong bone which resembles a human genital. And this dates to about 1,600 years. So that shows the significance and the interaction that us Sri Lankans had with the dugong and the sea. Uh, what we have identified from our surveys is these are the main threats to dugongs. One is the bottom set gill net and also the drift net. But the main component is the bottom set gill net. A lot of people now use dynamite because uh, they go back. They have sufficient time to go back and actually bring in the dynamite and use it to kill the dugong. Because a kilogram of dugong flesh basically fetches between 1,000 to 1,500 rupees. And a dugong is like minimum about 300 kilos. By protecting the dugong, we get to protect the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin and the finless porpoise as well, which are endangered species. And they share the same habitat as the, as the dugong. Also, species like the guitar shark and so many. So because by protecting the uh, dugong, we can also conserve the rest of the uh, biome as well. The Ministry of Education today announced that all government and private schools will close on the 8th of December for year-end vacations and will reopen on the 2nd of January next year. Meanwhile, the Department of Examinations also announced today that all activities related to the GCE ordinary level examination, such as tuition classes, seminars, advertising and distribution of handbills, will be prohibited from the midnight of the 6th to the 21st of December. Let's now take a look at other local stories making news from across Sri Lanka. Manusat Dirana, together with Pure Tech Lanka, vested the drinking water project with the students at Dimulagala Mahavidyalaya as a solution to their long time drinking water issue. Meanwhile, Manusat Dirana, together with Pure Tech Lanka, also vested another drinking water project in Galen Vindunuveva Anuradhapura today. A state bank was robbed in Kudavella Tangol today. The armed robbers stole cash and other valuables. A customer was injured in the incident. Other than a provincial correspondent of Vellavaya, SP Bandara, who was attacked recently, left the hospital this morning. A protest was held in Vellavaya today against the attack on the correspondent. You are watching Sri Lanka's award winning news channel. The Verena 24-7. In business news, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka says it will settle 61% of central investments and finance PLC depositors in full. 
thereby the compensation of depositors will be doubled from 300,000 rupees to 600,000 rupees following the cancellation of the license issued to Central Investments and Finance PLC on the 6th of November this year. CIFL was confronted with the severe liquidity crisis since 2013 due to mismanagement and other irregular transactions carried out by the management of the company. Issuing a communique today, the central bank clarified that any revival plan needs at least 3 billion rupees of investments and at least 30 to 40 percent of deposits should be repaid immediately as they had not been paid interest or the capital of their deposits for the last four-year period following discussions with local and foreign institutions who expressed um, their interest in reviving the company. At the same time, the investors should be credible and the funds should be transferred to Sri Lanka through legal channels in the case of foreign investors, the central bank said in its statement. The total deposit liability of the company is about 3.5 billion rupees and the number of depositors stand around 4,092, of which 2,501 depositors are with deposits less than 600,000 rupees. Central Bank also informs the depositors that the other stakeholders of CIFL, the company, has the right to submit their objection to the Monetary Board within the time period mentioned in the Finance Business Act No. 42 of 2011, under which the cancellation notice has been issued. CBSL added that it will take legal action against those who are responsible for the frauds and misuse of depositors' funds of those companies. And it emerges that Sri Lanka is among four countries which were discussed at the inaugural Global Forum on Asset Recovery, which is part of the United States, UK, World Bank and UDOC's efforts to facilitate in the recovery of stolen assets. Delivering one of the keynote addresses at the event, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions said that cooperation of governments is essential in the fight against wide-scale corruption and misuse of state funds. The inaugural Global Forum on Asset Recovery, which is an initiative undertaken by the World Bank and United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, kicked off at the World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C., in the United States yesterday and will be held till tomorrow. This year's forum, which is hosted by the United States and United Kingdom, aims to facilitate the recovery of stolen assets from four countries, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Tunisia and Ukraine, by convening more than 150 law enforcement officials, prosecutors and financial centre representatives to discuss ongoing asset recovery cases. We have seized $3.5 billion worth of corrupt proceeds involved in money laundering offenses. Since 2004, the United States has returned millions in corrupt proceeds to compensate victims around the world. That recovery has only been possible because of the cooperation internationally. If they're not properly shared between nations, then in many cases justice just cannot be done or certainly it's delayed. So I challenge all of you to quickly and effectively devote more resources uh, to these problems. You know how serious these cases can be. Cooperation works. We fully respect your borders, but if we work together, respectful of each other's rights, we can more effectively stop transnational criminals. And we must do so. Well, Sri Lankan shares extended falls into a second session today and closed at the lowest in nearly three months Dragged down by beverage stocks, the Colombo stock market's main index dropped 0.24% at 6,390.55, its lowest close since September 14th. It fell 0.03% last week, recording its fourth straight weekly drop, but has gained about 3% so far this year. Here's Demantha Matthew from um, Capital Holdings for a full report of the trading flow. The SPI saw a high volatility during the day, uh, experiencing downward trend uh, towards the final hour of trading, uh, losing about 15 points. Both the turnover and volume improved during the day. However, uh, price depreciation was seen in 103 counters led by uh, Nestle and commercial leasing, while only 34 counters saw positive contribution. 
uh, led by Bukidara and Mel Sakov. Uh, the foreign participation was high during the day at around uh, 59% with commercial credit and HNB leading the way, uh, mainly on the buy side. And we saw a net foreign inflow of uh, 90 million rupees. And the Sri Lankan rupee closed stronger today, uh, led by selling of the dollar by exporters and year-end inflows of the greenback in the form of remittances. The spot rupee ended at 153 rupees and 30 cents to 40 cents per dollar, compared with yesterday's close of 153 rupees and 55 to 60 cents. In your top international news, Australia is to ban foreign political donations as part of a crackdown aimed at preventing external interference in domestic politics. Speaking today, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said the country is concerned about rising Chinese influence. Addressing media in Canberra earlier today, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said that foreign powers were making unprecedented and increasingly sophisticated attempts to influence the political process in Australia and the world. New laws modelled in part on the US Foreign Agents Registration Act would criminalise foreign interference and require the registration of lobbyists working for nation states. The announcement came as concern grows in Australia that Beijing may be extending its influence and as relationships between politicians and Chinese government interests have become increasingly contentious. Now we have recently seen disturbing reports about Chinese influence. I take those reports, as do my colleagues, very seriously. But these reforms are not about any one country. Foreign interference is a global issue. There, for example, we're all familiar, and I know you're all very familiar, uh, with very credible reports that Russia sought to actively undermine the United States election, undermine the integrity of the US election, and seek to influence it. The reforms will include a new foreign influence transparency scheme. President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, announced yesterday that he was hoping that more sufficient progress will be made with the United Kingdom to push forward the Brexit talks before the European Council summit later this month. Juncker was speaking at a press briefing alongside British Prime Minister Theresa May after the two met at the EU Commission headquarters in Brussels, Belgium. Juncker told reporters that he and many discussed the UK's financial settlement or the so-called divorce bill, citizens' rights and the Irish border issue, but the two sides had failed to clinch a deal. Despite our best efforts and the significant progress we and our teams have made over the past days on the three main withdrawal issues, it was not possible to reach a complete agreement today. We stand ready to resume the negotiations with the United Kingdom here in Brussels later this week. I'm still confident that we can reach sufficient progress, sufficient progress before the European Council of the 15th of December. The U.S. Supreme Court handed a victory to President Donald Trump yesterday by allowing his latest travel ban targeting people from six Muslim-majority countries to go into full effect. The move comes even though legal challenges continue in lower courts on the travel ban, which President Trump insists is to protect the United States from terrorism by Islamic militants. The nine-member court, with two liberal justices dissenting, granted his administration's request to lift two injunctions imposed by lower courts that had partially blocked the ban, which is the third version of a contentious policy that Trump first sought to implement a week after taking office in January. The high court's action means that the ban will now go fully into effect for people from Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria and Yemen seeking to enter the United States. You are watching Sri Lanka's Trusted News Brand.
other than a 24 7. Minister of Sports Dasiri Jaisekar recalled nine cricketers heading to India last night for the upcoming one day international series as they failed to get the approval of the minister. Minister, um, however, granted the approval to the nine recalled players this evening. I did not receive the relevant spot playing in the ODI and T20 series with India, which was selected by the selection committee within the due period. I was not aware of the team until last evening. When players are going abroad, they should go with my permission. But that did not happen. So taking this into consideration, I stopped them from flying from Sri Lanka. It was yet another torrid day for Sri Lankan cricketers, both with the bat and ball, as India set a mammoth target of 410 runs for Sri Lanka for victory. The tourists' hopes of a victory in the third and final test soon evaporated as Indian bowlers reduced Sri Lanka to 31 runs for three wickets at stumps at the end of the fourth day. Resuming the innings from an overnight score of 356 for nine, Sri Lanka added a further 23 runs to their tally. The highlight of the session was Sri Lankan captain Dinesh Chandimal reaching 150 before falling for 164. Coming out to bat in the second innings, Indian openers wanted quick runs. Shikhar Dhawan made 67 of 91 deliveries with even the likes of Chiteshwar Pujara going after Sri Lankan bowlers. Pujara fell one short of his half ton but skipper Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma posted quick fire 50s. With their lead extended considerably, India declared on 246 for 5, setting Sri Lanka a target of 410 runs for victory. In the 16 overs, Sri Lanka played in their second innings before the close of play. They only managed 31 runs at the cost of three wickets. Tomorrow is the last day of the match and Sri Lanka require a further 379 runs for victory with seven wickets in hand. Meanwhile, in Australia, the hosts set England a target of 354 in the second Ashes test. Australian second innings collapsed to 138 all out, leaving the visitors a rather tricky total to navigate. With tomorrow being the last day of the match, England are 176 for the loss of four wickets, needing another 178 runs to win the match and tie the series at 1-1. Oh, that's out! No, Peter Hanscom saying no. Early. That's a good catch. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel, other than a 24-7. And we cross over to the Weather Center for your forecast first evening edition. Good evening and welcome to Forecast First. Now, if you take a look at the map, you can see that temperatures are to vary between 20 and 29 degrees Celsius. Now, you can also expect a low pressure zone developing in the eastern region of the island and will gradually move towards the southeast and then to the central region island of the course of the day. Now, this could bring about some thundershots in Jaffna, Trincomalee, Patiklo and Mena. And moving downwards, we can also expect some thundershots in Colombo, Gaul, Candy and Matara. Now, if we take a look at the map that is to follow, you can see that the Invest 93W cyclonic system, which is formed in the southeast Bay of Bengal, uh, currently situated 950 kilometers away from Sri Lanka and is moving towards India. Now, this is expected to form into a deep depression in the next 24 hours and we expect to bring some heavy showers and strong winds in the north and east coastal belts of Sri Lanka. We will keep a close watch on this system and we will bring you the very latest. It's now time to take a look at your city by city forecast. And that wraps up tonight's edition of First at Nine. You can connect us on social media by visiting facebook.com slash first at nine or twitter.com first at nine for the very latest developments from across the world. Before we go, we'd like to take you to the Kanelia Forest where the beautiful Anagimala Alla Falls through the forest bed, attracting many local as well as foreign tourists. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.
bringing you the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Adha Dharana 24-7.